Winchester's little-known but remarkable Model 71 lever-action rifle and gain-twist rifling on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Answering Questions and Trying to Come Up with the Right Answers. I got an interesting letter from a gentleman. Where he's got a 348 Winchester. Have you ever heard of the 348 Winchester? It's kind of a famous round, even though it wasn't all that popular. Uh, Winchester made that particular rimmed cartridge for a new not quite big bore, but bigger than 30-30 bore, lever action rifle called the Model 71. And it's quite famous for being considered the smoothest, slickest, bestest, (laughs) classical tubular fed magazine Winchester rifle ever. Uh, And this gentleman has got one. He writes in that his father had them. He said, at one point, my father had a, I had three 348s causing a friend to say of my father, he is the curator of 348s. Uh, What this gentleman ever says is Model 71, because the 348, of course, is the cartridge, not the rifle. My father ended up selling one and leaving one to my brother and myself. And by that, I think he means one to each of them. My father hunted in Maine with a 348 and a great deal, but for all those years and all those miles, he only killed one button buck with that rifle. I myself am not real fond of peep sights in low light situations. The 348 has gobs of personality, and it's such a smooth lever action. He's got that right. In looking up prices for the 348, this would be used rifle prices, I saw several of them for sale with scopes mounted, one attached to the side, and that was on a hinge to flip out of the way, and one of them had a scope that mounted way down the barrel. Must have been a pistol scope with long eye relief. Yeah, I got that right. As neat as the 348 is, I just can't find an application for it in my life. My disability requires flat shooting rounds with a good scope. When very young, I did extensive hunting with the Model 94 3030, which is the little brother to the 348, killing many groundhogs with it. That was my high water mark with Winchester's lever action rifles. And that was Carl. Carl, I want to thank you for bringing that up. Uh, now, the 348 Winchester is, is also interesting, and it's the only 34 caliber. Why Winchester went with a 348 instead of a 358 kind of is a mystery. Some people suggest that they were thinking, well, since we had so much good luck with this oddball, rifle we call the 270 Winchester. Why not try it with the uh, new Model 71 chambered for a 348? Maybe that'll catch on similarly. I think the problem with this rifle and cartridge was that it came in, uh, I think it was 19... 35 that they released it and by then hunters and shooters were starting to realize the better performance potential of sharply tipped bullets and of course the tubular feed magazine rifles were just not set up for that so they have to use blunt nosed cartridge or bullets and that slows things down you can put a lot of energy behind them but they lose that energy because of their um, drag and I think that's probably hindered some of the success. The other thing was it was a pretty expensive rifle. It, that's why I think it's so smooth and so revered for being such a high quality lever action rifle. But it did have a lot of punch and power. I think it was throwing 200 grain bullets around 24 100 feet per second. So it was good in the woods for deer especially, but black bears and elk real well too. But it was a heavy rifle. It was essentially the 1886, which was a really big, strong Winchester designed by John Moses Browning with two big locking bars coming up at the back of the the bolt body. Um, So it was really strong and could handle the higher pressures and such. Only 70,000 or so of them were made between release and about the mid 30s up until around 1950 and by then i think most hunters are going with faster cartridges like the 30 out six family and into the magnums but boy if you want a a lever action rifle that is hard hitting and smooth and all the rest of it something really special 
Look around for a used model 71 Winchester and you'll stumble onto it. Like maybe you could give your dad a gift one to you <laughs> like a Carl had here. But thanks for bringing that up, Carl. I really appreciate that. We don't get often opportunities to discuss the Model 71 because there's just so few around. You don't see them very often. Now, Winchester did release a new version of it several years ago. This would have been uh, Morocco uh, in Japan making it for them. I did test fire one of those several times. <laughs> it is as advertised, very smooth lever action rifle. But like Carl, I just couldn't find a specific use for it, so I didn't pick one up. I think the 358 Winchester cartridge is actually providing better ballistics. And that, of course, is the 308 necked up to 35. But something you might want to look into if you're into lever action rifles. Now, here's something from uh, Patron Jarrett. Good evening, listening to your podcast, the number 309 about twist rates. As you can tell from previous messages of mine, twist rates intrigue me. <laughs> that is true. Jarrett and I have been discussing twist rates quite a bit. Jarrett goes on, you mentioned faster twist rates, meaning bigger wall against the bullet getting going in the barrel. And what I mean by that is if you have a fast twist rate, the the engraving of the bullet happens abruptly. That bullet is essentially slamming into a, a wall um, of rifling, the grooves and the lands right there. So you get higher pressures if you have a fast twist rate, and you get it immediately when that bullet leaves the cartridge and strikes the rifling. So Jerry continues, well, I have an idea. Why not have the twist in the barrel start slowly and increase as the twist gets closer to the end of the barrel? Almost like a car getting going from a standstill. You've got to put in it, put it in granny or you'll tear up the tranny. <laughs> Wouldn't that decrease barrel burnout? What are your thoughts? Well, here's what I wrote back to Jarrett very briefly. Ah, Jarrett, you have hit upon the old gain twist rifling system. It's been around for a long, long time. And the idea being to minimize the pressure spike. It does nothing to change barrel burnout. That is a product of flame temperature at the throat, not bullet friction. Gain twist never really took off. Now, if I could elaborate a bit, gain twist, I think, was invented by Alexander Pope. Uh, I think that was his first name. Pope was a barrel maker extraordinaire back in the late 19th century and he was building barrels for precision shooting with lead bullets and muzzle loaders um i'm not sure i'm sure he used some breech loaders as well but they were using muzzle loading bullets and he found that a gain twist made for an easier starting of the bullet or something about muzzle loading that bullet was there was some kind of a perceived benefit from this gain twist. I don't quite understand what that would be. But mainly it reduced the lead fouling. When you think of a fast twist immediately upon ignition, the uh, lead bullet is being smeared or grabbed and ripped a little bit by the rifling if it's really steep. So by getting velocity going down the barrel as the twist rate then increases, you reduce the lead stripping of the bullet. And I think that's uh, the benefit that they found with lead bullets. But once the jacketed bullets came in, you really didn't have that problem anymore. So there's not really a, a hugely noticeable increase in accuracy, but there is a little decrease in pressure. And what that enables folks with gain twist barrels to do, if they're hand loaders, is to increase the powder charge a little bit and gain a little bit of velocity because they have less immediate pressure spikes. So their max chamber pressures aren't as high thanks to that reduced friction of the gain twist rifling. Uh, Bartline Barrels specializes in gain twist and they think it works pretty well, but I just haven't seen or heard a lot of convincing arguments that it really makes that big of a deal. I think if it would, we would see a lot more gain twist barrels out there and we just don't. So I think the evidence is kind of piled up over the years that it, it's a great theory, but it probably isn't worth all the trouble. But if you want to look into gain twist barrels, check out Bartline barrels and see what they have to say about it and then research it some more. And you might find that there's a good reason to try one. All right. Appreciate that. Yeah, Jarrett. Now, what else do we have here? Ron, you've hit upon, oh, that was just one I <laughs> just finished, guys. Sorry about that. Now, what else do we have here that uh, my dear wife, Betsy, brought me? This is from Chuck. 
Hi, Ron. Whenever people compare you to the legendary Jack O'Connor, you always very humbly deflect the compliment. So I'm going to say something a little differently. I think you're better than old Jack. Oh, my goodness. I should have read this before. This is kind of embarrassing. Hmm. Well, my wife wanted me to read this. Apparently, that's why she stuck it on here. So I would respect her wishes. Continue. Yes, Jack O'Connor was a true pioneer in hunting journalism and the chief promoter of the 270 Winchester. He hunted all over the world, and with his writing, he brought sport hunting into the spotlight for the average American for the first time. That's a pretty good analysis, Chuck. But, big but here, he had a reputation for being a little big-headed and opinionated and even difficult to get along with by some standards. You are just not like that. You respect everyone's opinion and even welcome criticism. You can laugh at yourself and instruct the rest of us at the same time without feeling threatened by folks who differ with you. Your easygoing nature leaves Jack in the dust. Keep up the good work, Chuck. Oh, gosh, Chuck. Betsy, I'm going to get you for this. <laughs> but, hey, I really appreciate that fine compliment. I mean, getting compared to someone of the stature of Jack O'Connor is really something. Um, and, and as far as m my not being opinionated, I found out over the years when I was opinionated in my youth that I was often wrong. <laughs> and one just learns to be humble when he's proven wrong is too many times. And so my, ad my attitude here in my latter years of doing this work is kind of the wisdom that you pick up from having been there, done that a few times. And, and you realize that we are all in this together. Nobody knows everything, even though we often think we do. Um, but even when you've studied a lot and really have the data down, there are some times when you're just plain wrong or proven wrong. The flat earthers have figured that out long ago. I mean, there's just all kinds of ancient wisdom that we were all supposed to know that was eventually proven wrong. So I always try to keep an open mind and recognize that everyone else is on a similar journey. We learn as we go, and I try to learn from others as much as I can while sharing what I have learned. So I really appreciate that fine compliment, Chuck. Now let's see what Danny has to say. Ron, thanks for the great information you share. I am new to deer hunting and I was advised to get a 243 rifle. I'm located in South Oklahoma. Do you think this is a good rifle for beginner deer hunters? And what brand rifle do you advise me to get? Thanks. Well, Danny, this is a big question and it's complicated pretty commonly asked because anyone new to hunting has to pretty much decide this stuff when they have very limited information on which to base their judgments. So I recommend you continue listening to my channel and others on cartridges and rifles and study them a lot and find some books that will explain how rifles work and what the various cartridges do and get an understanding of what the 243 Winchester is and where it falls in this panoply of cartridges. It's essentially considered a small caliber and light does not recoil much, quite accurate. Because of that, you just don't flinch or even have any need to because it's such an easy shooting little cartridge. Fairly fast, it throws a 100 grain bullet around 3,000, perhaps 3,100 feet per second, which is pretty speedy. And that adds a lot of energy to the bullet, kinetic energy. The bullets are long and pointy, so they retain that energy really well. And they shoot fairly flat out to three, 400 yards. That is about the limit you want to stretch it to for deer. And out in Oklahoma, an open country like you have, you might be looking at some fairly long shots. You don't have to take them, obviously. One of the mistakes that people make is if they see a deer at 500 yards, they then have to shoot at it. <laughs> no, just get a little closer. You can always stalk closer. And once you get inside of 300 yards, I have found that the 243 Winchester, even with some 80 and 85 grain bullets, is quite deadly. Uh, you just need to park that bullet behind the shoulder, unless you're using an all-copper bullet or a premium controlled expansion bullet, such as a uh, Nosler Partition, Swift A-frame, or some kind of a bonded bullet, like um, AccuBond, something like that that stays together and retains its mass to keep penetrating deeply. But boy, even the more frangible bullets, once you get it behind that shoulder without hitting any major muscle groups, gets into the heart and lungs and just sort of goes to pieces and creates a lot of hemorrhaging very quickly for a, a quick demise. So I don't think you'll have any trouble taking uh, Oklahoma 
White Tails with the 243 Winchester. And I assume that's the one you mean when you say 243. We hunters and uh, shooters have a, a habit of just using a cartridge's um, bullet numbers or calibers when we really mean the cartridge. So we'll say, I want a 243. Well, that could mean the 243 bullet, 0.243 inches in diameter, and that could be thrown by a 6 millimeter Remington, a 240 Weatherby, the new 6 millimeter Creedmoor, and several others. So I'm assuming you mean the 243 Winchester, which is the most popular. And I think you'll do well with it. Yeah. So good luck with that, Danny, and enjoy your deer hunting. Oklahoma has some good opportunities and some big whitetails. One more here before we get to the, the new stuff on the computer. Um, this guy is just naming himself or herself user. And I hope they mean they're, <laughs> I don't know what they're using, but I hope it's the good stuff. <laughs> Hey, I love the information, Ron. You've saved me loads of time and probably some money by sharing what you know about hunting. Well, appreciate that. I hope I have. Recently, I bought a 308 Winchester that was on sale, and I didn't expect much right out of the box. But I did expect that at 200 yards, I could easily keep a 3-inch group without having to change the scope and or ammunition. I zeroed it at 100 yards, no problem, five shot groups, and I increased it to 200 yards. My first five shots were completely off the page, and a 12-inch target? What is going on here? I stopped, and I inspected my ammo, and I found that the soft point, 150-grain bullets that I was using, had fractures in the lead soft point and could easily flake off using my thumb. Hmm. After finding three rounds that seemed to be unaffected, I made a three-inch group on page without changing anything about my setup. My theory is that the fractured lead points were flying off in mid-flight, making them behave erratically. Have you ever experienced this, and are polymer-tipped bullets or monolithic the answer to this problem? Wow, I've got to say, uh, user, I have not ever seen anything like this. I've never heard about such a thing. The lead flaking off, was was it actually breaking into chunks or just little thin flakes on the surface? And I don't, if it was the latter, I don't understand why that would make things radically inaccurate. It may be that internally, the lead was not matching up or balanced with the jacket. What sometimes happens with uh, a bullet jacket is essentially a cup. It's gilding metal usually, and they form it, punch it to form a long tube, open at the top, and then they either insert a lead cable and then squeeze the tip into the shape of the bullet, the final shape, <clears throat> or they'll sometimes pour molten lead in and shape the bullet. And sometimes there can be air gaps between the lead and the jacket material. And if they don't have good quality control, the jacket itself can be of varying thicknesses. And the fact that this lead was flanking off, as you said, suggests that perhaps the lead alloy wasn't exactly right. Things weren't all together. So maybe they had some of these air gaps inside between the lead and the jacket. Between the lead and the jacket. So um, that's the best I can come up with. But I have never seen a rifle that would group well at 100 yards and suddenly just miss a 12-inch paper at 200. That is a wild one. Um, anyone else out there have anything similar to this? Now, certainly, if you switch to a monolithic bullet, you wouldn't have any of this problem because there's no two materials to have imbalances. It's just all copper. And polymer tip bullets, you know, they could be have the same problem. It's just that they put a polymer tip on it instead of having the exposed lead tip. So you could easily have gaps inside and all the rest of it with a polymer tip bullet. But generally, these days, bullets are made with with great quality control, and I wouldn't expect this kind. So I don't know how old your ammunition was or what type or anything, but I just don't have any easy answers for you other than what I said. So, all right, one more quick one from John. It does not very long. He says, Ron, thanks for the great videos. I like watching. How can I learn to not flinch and keep my eye, my scope eye open while I'm shooting? This is something you do really well. Well, thanks, John. This is something that I have trained to, to do really well, and that's what you will need to do. And anyone can do it. The trick is to dry fire a lot. And with this in mind, you just think, okay, empty rifle. It's not going to flinch because there's no shot coming, no recoil, so I can keep my eye open. So you just line up on your target. You concentrate on the target and the reticle being right where you want it or the open sights. Um, 
keep your eyes open and think about if there's a bullet going down range, I want it like an arrow where I can watch it land. You're not going to see that fast bullet. But the idea is to know where your crosshair was when the trigger broke. When it goes click, you should be able to say, boy, that little bit of movement of my finger moved the crosshair a little bit left and down. That's probably where my shot's going to land. It's called calling your shots. So keep your eye open and do that again and again and again until you have trained yourself to keep both eyes open and click call your shot. Then if you can, have your partner behind you load your rifle or not. This is the key. They hand you the rifle. You think it's loaded. You do your thing. And if your brain is now switching back to Flinchville, <laughs> you will know you flinched because that rifle will be empty. Your buddy having not really put around in it. And this really works. After two or three of those, you go, wow, what an idiot. I'm jerking, anticipating recoil. I got to just think about the target and the sight picture and squeezing the trigger without jerking and click. Yeah. Click. Yeah. Working every time. When your buddy sees that you're not jerking and flinching, eventually he'll slip a live round in. You won't think about it and you'll make a perfect shot and you won't even feel the recoil. I know this because I have done it. Had a 30 out six and I was flinching when I was younger. Did this trick and bingo, I scored when I didn't think about recoil. All that kind of practice is what does it. So there you go. I hope that works for you. Now let's see what the team has pulled up for us. Trying to stump me here. Uh-oh. Oh, my gosh. This is a long one. What is this about? This is from Garth. Flight instructor, uh-oh, airline pilot, I think I know where this is going. We're going to Coriolis, and we're not going to get there. No, it looks like he has a good, long explanation, but I don't know that anyone wants to hear it. So we're just going to breeze through it here really quickly. Inertia, spin of the earth, all this. Oh, let's try this. Near the end, he says, to be short. This sounds like a summation. We can do that. There is no force acting on the bullet in Coriolis effect. That is true. It is not a force. It's just an effect. The effect is simply a consequence of the ground moving at different speeds at different latitudes. That is it. The velocity component related to the rotation of the earth of your bullet when it leaves the muzzle is fixed at that latitude. So when it moves to a different latitude, it's no longer in sync with the surface of the earth. Yeah, that is a good summation and succinct. So I think you guys understand that now. And and again, with bullets, you really don't get enough distance. You're not changing latitudes that much when you're firing a shot. Don't worry about it if you're a hunter. Extreme range shooters have to think about this. And pilots, of course, because they're going hundreds of miles. So don't worry too much about the Coriolis effect. But it is a result of the earth spinning faster at the equator than it does further north or south. All right, here is someone from Ireland, Ivan from Ireland. Hi, Ron, can you advise if any SA shotgun should be compared to a semi-auto rifle uh, if it was using slugs and rifle chokes? I'm not sure I'm driving, what he's driving at here. Can you advise if or any SA shotgun could be compared to a semi-auto rifle if it was using slugs and chokes Rifle chokes. SA center fire rifles are hard to obtain in Ireland, hence the line of questioning. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Shotgun. Single action. Shotgun is meant by SA. At any rate, it comes down to what can he get using slugs in a shotgun and a rifle to choke? Well, you can get pretty reasonable accuracy. You're not going to match up with a rifle for, for fine accuracy, but gosh, you can keep it at least inch and a half. Um, at 100 yards, I've seen that happen with the right combination, the right slug, the right twist, um, whether you go with sabos in your slugs or any of the different options. But what the big problem is with shotguns and slugs for inaccuracy is the loose fit. With rifles, we've got a real snug connection between the barrel and the action. And we make sure everything is perfectly concentric and all this nitpicky stuff with blueprinting your actions. Then you grab a shotgun and you pull the barrel off and you put the barrel back on and you turn it on with a little nut on the front under a semi-auto or a pump action. 
You just don't build shotguns as rigidly as you do rifles. Plus, the barrel is fairly thin, not heavy and thick like a rifle. So it's going to have a lot more vibrations and oscillations than things. So if you can find a shotgun that's specifically designed for slugs, like the, let's see, there's a Savage rifled shotgun slug barrel, thick, heavy barrel, um, built a lot more strength and integrity than your typical shotgun barrel. That is going to help a lot. Uh, there are there were single shot slugsters. I think H and R had one. Maybe they still do. That were built similarly, real stiff and strong with thick barrels. That's what you want to look for to help with your accuracy. But boy, out to some of those shotguns can be pretty accurate out to two hundred yards. And I have heard of guys who really work with it and tweak it, and they can get to three hundred yards. But remember, they're using sabos, the plastic skirts around a smaller bullet, so it's not the full diameter one. That gives you a higher ballistics coefficient for better long range performance on drops and deflections in the wind and such. But it can be done, Ivan. So look for that heavy, stiff. Well built. Some guys will even epoxy the barrels into the actions of shotguns to make things stiffer. Lots of good options there. You might want to look into that stuff. All right. This is from Oregon. Jonathan. Hello, Ron. I'm a big fan of this show. Uh, I'm waiting to get into re. Oh, I'm wanting to get into reloading and wondering how to safely explore and experiment the endless combination of loads. Well, that's a simple answer, and I've given it many times on this show. It's just get those hand-loading manuals and study them. Read from chapter one on through. They give you all the information you need on what's going on and how to do it, and then just follow the recipes. Get their starting load. This is a safety factor. You use a low dose of powder as listed in there, and then you work your way up. To choose which powder, I always go to the one that looks the most efficient out of their list. They'll usually have five to ten different powders for any one particular bullet load in one cartridge. Uh, so you say, well, this one peaks out at 2,700 feet per second. But this other powder, they get a top-end velocity of 3,000 feet per second. Suggests that that one has a lot more potential. So you can look at that. Other hand-loading manuals will usually highlight the most accurate load. You might want to try that. A particular powder seems to produce the best accuracy. So a couple of routes you can go there. But that, that is really the simple way to do it. Now, I will mention that we are thinking about producing a hand-loading course. It would be me hand-loading, showing all the tools and describing what to do and what problems to look out for and little tricks of the trade and offering that for sale. Uh, my team is saying that they, well, those things are really popular. People like instruction like that. So I'm just wondering if any of you guys are interested in it. Let me know, write in and say, hey, yeah, I'd love to uh, see a course on how to hand load. And if we get enough interest, we will produce these in in segments, I guess, you know, I'll do a 15, 20 minute, maybe a half hour, keep them fairly simple and understandable so they don't drag on like I'm prone to do sometimes. <laughs> and uh, man, maybe you guys be interested in that. So let me know. All right, Danny from Johannesburg. You might pronounce that Donnie, I think. Hi, Ron. Thanks for the great podcast and your YouTube channel. As a new hunter, I have really learned a lot from you, and I truly appreciate that you share your expertise, especially as you have experienced hunting in Africa. I have a question about laser bore sighters. I have recently bought a new rifle and scope, and I've seen that there are many laser bore sighters on the market that promise to keep your sight in your rifle with amazing accuracy and it save you from wasting bullets on sighting in. Are laser bore sighters really worth it? Or is it just a money-making scheme? Are they worth it? Which one is the best? I see two main types. One that looks like a cartridge that's inserted into the chamber. And another that it is inserted into the front of the barrel. Or is, are these just a waste of money? I'd like to hear your opinion. You know, Donnie, I don't think they're a waste of money. But I don't think they're absolutely necessary either. They're certainly convenient. Um, I have found that some of them don't project a bright enough a little laser beam on target that I can use them in bright daylight. So I have to wait for low light to do it. If you do it indoors where the lights can be controlled, I often find that I don't have enough room to get a real accurate read on it. But they certainly do work in both types. I like the ones that go into the chamber, but those don't always fit every chamber size. 
uh, perfectly. The ones that slide into the muzzle are fairly simple to use, and I've had fair luck with those. But you know what works the best for me? And the manufacturers aren't going to like me saying this because it does not involve giving them your money. <laughs> it is bore sighting. And it works with bolt action rifles and single shots in which you can look down the barrel. Lever actions, mm, not unless you're good with mirrors. <laughs> but if you got an action that you can open and look through the breech and on down the barrel, it's just a simple matter of lining up your target visually inside of the bore. You look down the bore and you say, okay, there's my center target. I'm going to move things until ooh, that's perfectly lined up. And now I'm going to get up there and adjust my scope turrets until the crosshair is looking at the same spot that I'm seeing down the center of the bore. I did that the other day. I always do this. I did it the other day with a new rifle and I was an inch off at a hundred yards just by eyeballing it. So that's what I would recommend. But hey, if you like the convenience of just popping one of those lasers on there, you got a little extra money and want to buy something fun, they certainly work. All right, Christopher from Arizona, who is 73. I appreciate that. Hanging in there, man. Good for you. <laughs> uh, I prefer to hunt with a 7 millimeter 08 with a 1 and 8.5 inch twist as my light rifle. I want to hunt moose and caribou in Newfoundland. Some people think I should quit hunting if I can't use at least a 7 rem mag or a 300 win mag. I disbelieve that a 150 grain Barnes TTSX from that 7 millimeter 08 won't drop any antlered game inside of 300 yards, preferably 200 or less. What are your thoughts? I wonder how these younger guys will feel when <laughs> they have arthritic shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I'm all with you here, Christopher. A lot of guys are in your boat, um, including some friends of mine. When you start getting shoulder issues and shoulder pain and stuff, you just don't need high recoiling rifles. And the, the point is your 7 millimeter 08 is more than capable of taking down the biggest moose in Newfoundland or anywhere else. Uh, and I always have to go back to Bell, Karamojo Bell in Africa, shooting elephants with a 757 Mauser. You're shooting roughly the same thing as a 7 millimeter 08, just in a different shape. So yeah, 140, 150 grain bullets. And with today's bullets of the quality you mentioned, that tripped, tipped triple shock Barnes bullet, the monolithic copper bullets that peel open at the nose expand beautifully and reliably, and they retain 80 to 100% of their weight. So they penetrate extraordinarily well. They are better than the old cup and core bullets that were so prominent for so many years. That's just a step up that changes light rifles into Hitters like their heavy rifles. So I'm all behind you on this 708. You will have no problems taking big animals with it. Um, go for it and show these young guys what it's like to be a 73-year-old hunter who can still get the job done. More power to you, Chris. All right, now we're just bouncing all over the globe. I love this. This is from Sweden. Marcus. Hi again, Ron. I just received a message linked to your clip on the 7x57 from text me and then a bunch of numbers thanks for watching you've been selected on oh, another one of these scams you've been selected as a winner is this fake <laughs> you better know it marcus this never ends these people i don't know they just are i don't know if they're too lazy to get a real job or they're just by nature like to scam people but yeah there are plenty of scams out there folks anytime someone's offering you a free lunch you know it's not going to be a free lunch. There is no such thing. So we are not having contests. We are not picking out random winners and giving you something special. They're just going to ask for some money to ship it to you, and you're never going to see it or your money again. Sorry about that, Marcus. But hey, good luck hunting over in Sweden. I hope you're having some good luck over there. All right, now we're going to come back to the good old U.S. of A., and we're going to go to Kentucky, where Donald asks us something. I'm not a reloader, so it is possible to take factory ammo and have them, oh, the bullets pulled and replace them with a heavier one. It's a 26 nozzler in an X-Bolt rifle. I have the ABLR 142 grain. Shots are not far, 50 to 200 yards. Too much gun, I know, for such close range. The reason my shot, the... Uh, 
doe. Oh, the reason this doe I shot at, at 115 yards on the shoulder, you could see the impact, softball sized spot. She fell, got up, and walked off, and we never found her in a cut cornfield. Little to no blood. Maybe just a fluke or a bad shot that looked good. Thanks, Ron. Holy mackerel. Hmm, 115 yards, a 26 nozzler. He, an Acubon long range, those bullets can come apart. I've seen this happen, and I've heard some others complaining about it. I thought the Acubond was a bonded bullet, meaning the lead core is bonded to the jacket, so it holds together in one piece really well. And the LR long range is a better shape, long boat tail, long secant ogive probably, so a long sleek, sleek shape designed for long range shooting. And then I would assume long range hits. At 115 yards, and especially at the velocity of a 26 nozzler, Ooh, you are putting in undue stresses on that bullet. I would recommend you go to an all copper bullet where there's really nothing to come apart. You might lose a couple pedals on it, but you're going to get extreme penetrations from that. The best I can tell you is I'm guessing that that bullet went to pieces on the shoulder before you got into the vitals. And that's why you lost that deer. So this is what I suggest you try. Or always aim just behind the shoulder. If you can just get it through the ribs, that bullet should do a great job. But <clears throat> you've got a lot of velocity in that 26 nozzle right there. That is a better application for some 300 to 500 yard shots rather than 115. So that's my take on it, Don. Good luck with it. That looks like it. So... Thanks to everyone, and apologies to Garth. Garth was the uh, pilot who gave us this long description of Coriolis, and while I didn't read it all, his summation was spot on, so I suspect the details in this letter were spot on as well, so I just didn't have time to read all of that, Garth. So Ireland and, and South Africa and Sweden, this was great, guys. Appreciate you all writing in, and a special thanks to our patrons. We always appreciate you guys and love to answer your questions as soon as we get those. So until next time on our next podcast, I am hoping that you continue to hunt on us and shoot straight and have great luck doing so. This is Ron Spomer. Thanks for watching. See you next time.